Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to FaithBridge. Whether you are at our Klein campus in Center Court East or West or at our Woodlands campus, or if you're coming to us via online, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us at Faith Bridge today. We are right in the midst of a sermon series that we're calling Next. And it's all about how to take the next step in our journey with Christ. All of us from time to time find ourselves feeling a little stagnated, a little slowed down, a little uncertain about where it is God would have us go in the next season of our life. And in this series, we're wanting to look at the life of the Apostle Peter. Because if anyone had an interesting journey with Jesus, it was Peter. Never a dull moment with Peter. His spiritual highs were off the charts. And correspondingly, his lows were about as low as an individual can go. We're going to be looking at two episodes from his life, one in the Gospel of Luke and one in the Gospel of John. If you'll go ahead and turn there, uh, Luke 22 and John 21. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand and the ushers will be glad to give you one. We're going to see an experience in the life of Peter that was perhaps the lowest point of his life and then how Jesus was able to enter into that circumstance and renew, restore, forgive, and set Peter on a trajectory toward the next step that would have uh, ramifications for all of human history. Before we go there, though, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, we're grateful for a beautiful day and the opportunity we have to gather in your house. We're mindful this morning that we do so in safety, and we pray for the individuals, uh, particularly in Nepal, who uh, have lost loved ones, have lost property, who uh, are enduring untold pain. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be near to them. We thank you for your son Jesus and the salvation that we have through him. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher and guide us into all truth. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, without question, my favorite person in all the whole wide world is me. <laughs> now, I, I share that with you not so much as a confession as a simple statement of fact. I, it's not anything that I'm proud of, and I certainly don't recommend it to anyone. But truth be told, I think about me, talk about me, pray for me, plan for me, provide for me, look out for me more than anybody else I know. And the really frustrating, you could almost say the damning thing about that self-oriented way of life is that everybody else is number two and further back, up to and including some people that are very, very important to me. People like Jesus, people like my wife, my children, my friends, my colleagues. Selfishness has a way of putting us right at the front of the line and everybody else can just get in line. All of us have what I call cringe-worthy memories, those occasions, those events in our lives that the mere recollection of gives us the shivers. Just, we wonder, how on earth could I have said or done that stupid, stupid thing? And uh, one such episode from my life that illustrates the point I'm making about my selfishness took place when our three girls were still babies. Uh, as babies do, from time to time, they would cry out in the night and need some attention. And it was during that season of life that I perfected what I call 
the fake sleep breathing technique. (laughs) Now, in order to pull this off, as soon as you hear the child cry, you have to remain perfectly still so as not to give any indication that you have, in fact, heard the child. And the only movement is the gentle rise and fall of your chest as you inhale and exhale, convincing your spouse that you are with Mr. Sandman, sound asleep. I look back on that with uh, regret and with embarrassment that I was such a poor servant to my spouse during those days when, if ever she needed a servant, it was then. Let me just say, if there are any young fathers here, I, I wouldn't even go there. It won't serve you well. You won't feel good about it in years to come. I would feel like the world's biggest jerk in sharing all of this with you were it not for the knowledge that each one of you is just like me. We are all our own favorite person. And I know this to be true because the Bible teaches that we are fundamentally selfish creatures. We are all sinful. We are all broken. And a primary characteristic of sinfulness is to be selfish. In fact, I think an argument could be made that the essence of sinfulness is selfishness. It's all about us. It's not about God. It's not about anyone else. It's all about me. And I suppose knowing that we are such sinful, selfish people, we are apt then to put that on display for others at a moment's notice. You don't have to read the Bible to understand that people are selfish. You just have to open your eyes on any given day. And I can't think of another place on the planet more apt to reveal this characteristic we have than an airport and air travel in general. When I travel around the world on mission trips, I never cease to be amazed at how grown people, I mean people that can drive and vote and own homes and all sorts of grown-up things how they can be reduced to toddlers over a seat on an airplane. A failure to get ample storage space for their carry-on luggage can turn them into a whining brat. There's no getting around it. Selfishness is universal. And for the Christian, this is particularly bad news because few things can stagnate our spiritual lives like selfishness. Few things can derail us on our path of discipleship like being overly concerned with ourselves. And yet, time and time again, if we're honest, that's the predicament we find ourselves in. So what are we to do about it? How do we get past this selfish orientation and get on to the next step that Jesus has for us. Well, in the life of Peter, we see a magnificent picture of a man who knew something about selfishness and how Jesus was able to step into his life and not only restore a relationship, a relationship that had been broken, but to then turn this man Peter around and set him on a course that would not only change first century Palestine, but has changed the world right down to the present age. We're going to be looking, first of all, at an experience from Luke chapter 22. You will recall that on the last night of his earthly life, Jesus gave to Peter a very serious warning. And he said to him, Peter... Tonight, you are going to betray me. In fact, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will have denied knowing me three times. And of course, Peter was aghast at this accusation. No, he said, I I would die for you, Lord. I would never do such a thing. But we pick up in verse 54 of Luke 22. Then seizing him, that is Jesus, 
They led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Can you imagine a more painful, embarrassing, gut-wrenching moment than what Peter experienced that night? Even as he uttered the third betrayal, the Lord turns and sees him Their eyes lock, and in a moment, Peter suddenly knows, I am a selfish man. I am an utterly selfish man. A wound that no doubt he felt he would probably carry for the rest of his life. The shame, the bitterness, the guilt over what he had done. In the days following the death and resurrection of Jesus... Not just Peter, but really all of the disciples were confused about which way to go. You talk about taking next steps. This was a season of uncertainty for all of them. Jesus appeared to them several times, but along the way, he had not yet told them precisely what they were to do. And so they're somewhat unsure. They're all feeling guilty. Here they've spent three years of their life with this man, invested everything they have into him, He dies and is raised from the dead, which brings joy to their hearts. But now what? And so in their uh, uncertainty, they went back to doing something that they had done before they met Jesus. They went back to fishing. But then something very unexpected happened. And if you will then turn over just one book to the Gospel of John chapter 21 beginning at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I love the way Jesus goes the extra mile to restore Peter. To let Peter know, hey, all that has taken place between you and me, I I forgive you. We're good. I love you. I value you. And Jesus does it in the most interesting way. He uses uh, the device of memory to help Peter know My Lord still loves me. For starters, he calls out to Peter in precisely the same way that he did three years earlier, the first time that he called Peter. You'll remember from last week, if you were here, Pastor Ken told us about the call of Peter and how Jesus had told them to throw their nets on the other side of the boat when the one side wasn't working. And I'm sure when this happened, it was like Yogi Berra says, deja vu all over again. John suddenly realizes it's the Lord. And as soon as he says that, Peter clues in as well and dives into the water, headed for Jesus. When he comes ashore, the first thing that happens is that he smells and sees a fire. And I think it's no accident that John included this little tidbit in here because You know how powerful smells and aromas can be with regard to our memory? How they can take us right back to a particular place, a particular time, simply by smelling that smell? Well, the last time that Peter and Jesus were near a fire was the night that Peter betrayed him. And I have no doubt that for the rest of his life, Every time Peter would smell a fire, which was probably every day since that was how they cooked and stayed warm, the memory of that betrayal would come back to him. And in a very gracious, loving act, Jesus redeems that moment. Jesus calls Peter to the fire and in essence says to him, no longer do you have to feel guilty when you smell this familiar smell from this day forward It will only remind you of your restoration of my love for you, of the new next step in your journey. And then, of course, Jesus gives Peter three opportunities. He asks him three questions as if to cancel out all three denials. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's on those questions that I want us to spend a few minutes because it's in the question and answer period that takes place between Jesus and Peter that we begin to discover how we can move forward from our selfishness, how Jesus can restore us and help us live in ways that are pleasing to him outside of our own interests and desires. Jesus begins by asking him, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the text isn't really clear whether Jesus means, Peter, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? Or he could mean, Peter, do you love me more than you love fishing, more than you love these friends of yours? He could have meant either one, he could have meant both, but whatever the case, basically what Jesus is getting at here is a matter of priorities. Do you love me more than anything else? You know that I do, Lord, then feed my sheep. And in this moment, Jesus ties loving him with loving others in an inextricable bond. If you want to know how fervent your love is for Jesus, stop and consider how you treat other people. Notice that Jesus doesn't even bring up the matter of the betrayal. It's never mentioned. 
He gets right to the point. Look, Peter, we're good. Now, do you love me? Yes, I do. Then show it by serving other people. Feed my sheep. He doesn't say, Peter, do you love me? Then read your Bible more. Pray more. Go to church more. Nothing of the kind. No, he ties loving Jesus with loving others. We are able to love, the Bible says, because he first loved us. And as Jesus' love comes into our life, it always comes on its way to somebody else. Do you want to know how much you love Jesus? Stop and think about how much you love other people. Jesus says, feed my sheep. Well, who are the sheep? Well, that's an easy question to answer. Look at the text again. What does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. That would be everybody. Because Jesus created everybody. Jesus died for everybody. Jesus extends his offer of salvation to everybody. And so if you're wondering who it is in your life that you're supposed to feed, that you're supposed to serve and take care of, the answer is plain. It's any person that you come in contact with. It's anybody and everybody in the whole wide world. But now I understand that that can be somewhat of an overwhelming and daunting task. Sometimes the most challenging thing is simply knowing where to begin. And I like to think of serving others in terms of concentric circles. Starting with those closest to us first and then moving out as we feed the sheep Jesus has called us to feed. We need to start with the people that we live with. Whether that's our spouse, children, parents, siblings, roommate, whatever the case may be, The first sheep in our lives to feed are those that are right around us. And yet, isn't it a strange quirk of our sinfulness that we often find the people we love the most the most difficult to serve? We start doing silly, stupid things with the people we live with. Things like fake breathing techniques. (laughs) We start keeping track of who did what. We have a hyper-focus on fairness about things. Tell me, is the word fair found in any of the four Gospels? Is the word fair found in any portion of what Jesus taught? Not at all, my friends. Perhaps you say, well, you know, sure, that's tough on Peter. I mean, yeah, he had a low point, and good for him that he got restored and all. But before you just jump headlong into telling me that I've got to serve people, especially those right around me, when have I ever denied Jesus? Never. I've always been proud to be a Christian. I've never denied Jesus. Is that right? Well, I suspect that you probably have, just like me. Because you see... Everything about Jesus' life is others-oriented. Everything. The reason that he came to earth in the first place, his birth, his whole life and ministry, his death and resurrection, the fact that he prays for us right now at the right hand of the Father, it all screams, others, others, I live for others. He didn't just come preaching some do-gooder philosophy to think about other people once in a while. No, it's the very essence of his person. And so when we fail to serve other people, we're not just rejecting Jesus' teachings. We are rejecting the man. We are denying Jesus. And on that score, I think we all find ourselves guilty. Feed my sheep if you love me and start with those closest to you. Moving out from there, the circle of friends, neighbors, co-workers. It would really be interesting if we could take a poll 
of all of those people, our neighbors, our co-workers, the folks we bump into once in a while, if we could take a poll and ask them a question about you, ask them a question about the uh, quality of your servanthood, what would they say? Would they say, oh my goodness, he is the most proactive individual in the world. He's always looking out for us. Always thinking about ways that he can benefit and bless us. Or might their answer be something like, well, if I ask him to. Of course, there might be sort of a roll of the eye and a huff as he walks away. But uh, yeah, if he's, you know, prodded and poked, he'll get around to it. What would they say about us? When was the last time that in either one of those circles, with our family or with our friends, that we stepped up and asked, how can I serve you? What do you need done in your life? How can I make your life better? I'll be the first to admit, I stand at the front of the line in needing to ask those questions. A third circle of service is those people that Jesus referred to as the least of these. These are the people that we may not have any relationship with at all, but their needs are real and we have the capacity to meet those needs. Some of these people just need the basics. They just need food, clothing, shelter. And it's within our power to provide some of those things. Others of them simply need a friend. They're going through life alone. And they need someone to come alongside and value them, validate them, love them. Let them know they are worthy of kindness and love and friendship. And then there's a whole host of people out there who are hungry for eternal things. And we have the bread of life. We have the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we can take to them. There are no lack of sheep to be found anywhere around us. You say, Pastor Dan, hey, I'm convinced. I see it in Jesus. I see my own selfishness. How do I know where to start? Especially with that third circle Well, that's why we have a bridging ministry here at Faith Bridge. The entire reason we have a bridging ministry is to create opportunities for every single Faith Bridger to put shoe leather on their faith, get outside the walls of the church, and serve. Both here in Houston, through opportunities like the video we just saw, or even around the world on our mission trips. I can tell you about two opportunities that are available even right now. As you leave today, at every exit, you're going to be greeted by smiling individuals who will hand you a grocery bag. And on that grocery bag is a list of items that you can fill when you go to the store this week and then bring back next Sunday so that we make sure hungry people have something to eat. This coming Friday night, our missionaries to France, the Cross family, will be here at Center Court East to tell us about their ministry, to tell us about the church that we, Faith Bridge, are planting in France. Most people don't realize that Europe is spiritually dark in the extreme, and we're doing our part to shine a light for Jesus just north of Paris. Come learn about what God is doing there, what Faith Bridge is doing there. Come and consider the possibility of going on a mission trip. You know, France isn't a bad option when you talk about mission trips. (laughs) Beyond that, though, when the service is over, you can go to our bridging center. We have bridging center in both atriums, center court east and west, where we've got individuals who will be glad to tell you about all of the ways we're serving our community in the world. For those of you that are in the woodlands, as you leave and you go by the information center, You can find information there. We've got someone there who will be glad to help you. The point I'm making is finding something to do is as easy as gaining a little bit of information. We've got lots of opportunities to make all the difference in the world. And you don't have to do it alone. 
I mean, you could make it a family project. You could get your grow group involved. I'd love it if any number of folks left here deciding they are going to be the champion for bridging in their grow group, bringing it up at every meeting, looking for those opportunities to leave the Bible study behind for a few days and go out and do what the Bible says. There are no lack of opportunities. Can you imagine the impact that we could make if 3,500 people left here each week equipped, eager, and ready to serve this community? Some 2,000 years ago, 12 men were set on the next step of service and they changed the world. We are here today 2,000 years later, because of what those men did, just 12 of them. Can you imagine what 3,500 of us could do? We could change our homes, our neighborhoods, our city, our world, as we go forth empowered by the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you, what is your next step? In just a moment, I want us to pray, and you can just... Stay in your seats. I'm not going to ask folks to come forward, but I am going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to open up your heart and give God a chance to tell you what your next step is. Put aside the distractions, put aside lunch, put aside the busyness of the upcoming work week, and simply quiet yourself for a few moments and let God speak, because I promise He has something to say about your next step. Let's pray together. Father, we confess to you that far too often we are infected with a selfish bug, even to the point that it can consume our lives and make us lazy and unloving even to those we love the most. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Restore us, even as you restored Peter. And just as you set him on a path for the next step, I pray you'd whisper to each of our hearts about our next step. Help us to know This is the way. Walk in it. This is the opportunity that I have established for you. And then, Lord, give us grace to do it. Because in our own strength, we'll find other priorities. We'll find other reasons. So empower us to move forward. To feed your sheep. And to show you how much we love you as we feed them. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, our care and bridging pastor, who just brought part two of the series next, a look at Peter. And so when you look at Peter, we're going to talk a little bit more today about the denial of Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, You look at Peter as someone who was with Jesus all the time, one of his closest confidants, and um, how quickly he seemed to fall away under fire um, sure. and denying Christ. Um, but I think to myself, um, I don't, I've never denied Christ in that way. I've never stood in front of people and said, you know, I don't believe him or I don't know him. But I know that there's other ways that we can deny Christ too. What can that look like? Very much so. You know, it, it's always contextual. Uh, the, the denial that Peter experienced can never be duplicated because that experience is never going to happen again. That was unique to him. Mm -hmm. But we all have our own unique circumstances in which we deny Christ. Like you say, probably none of our listeners have ever stood up and said, I don't know Jesus or I have nothing to do with Jesus. Uh, That's just not 
something that happens in our culture. Uh, but we do deny Christ any time that we choose to live a life that is outside of the kind of life He calls us to. Um, what, what people fail to comprehend is that a rejection of what Christ taught us is not just a rejection of His teachings. It's a rejection of the man because mm -hmm. He was more than a teacher. He lived everything that He taught. He was the essence of everything that He taught. And so anytime that we sin, uh, whether it be uh, an overt sin against someone else or if it be uh, a sin of omission, failing to do something, it, it all adds up to a denial of Christ. And so I love how, as you move to the passage of John, you see this redemption and restoration of mm -hmm. him and their relationship and just the grace that characterizes our Savior. And from that um, place, we begin to serve others and literally feed people and the sheep. Yeah. And I think about um, a lot of the trips and places that we go, there's people who face very real denial of Christ Indeed. in situations all the time. Um, tell us some more about just some of the opportunities that we have to serve in those places in that way and just even here locally. Sure. I, I don't think uh, many faith bridgers know the expanse of serving opportunities that we have in our bridging ministry. On the international scene, we have uh, trips to every continent, we have well drilling trips for people who like to get dirty and muddy. I think you've even I been, on I one of, been on one of well those. I did. I've been on a well Yeah. Uh, we have trips uh, to Central America, which primarily focus on ministry to children. And so mm -hmm. if you love kids and you love uh, ministering to them and meeting their needs, there's the, that opportunity. Uh, in Africa, we have an opportunity to help a community begin to become self sufficient mm -hmm. by helping them build. Uh, chicken hatcheries and fish hatcheries and enabling these people to not only have jobs but food which mm -hmm. they, they desperately need. In India we have a multi-pronged ministry. Uh, a lot of it is humanitarian but some of it is working with kids. Some of it is working with Christian leaders. Of course I mentioned France mm -hmm. uh, and you were just yes, with me a month or so ago over there. So no lack of opportunities internationally, no lack locally. Uh, I've, I'm thinking right now primarily of our nonprofit Bridging for Tomorrow, mm -hmm. which works in the southern part of the Klein ISD, Title I schools. Health fairs, which we saw in the video, mentoring opportunities, one on one ministry to students, uh, campus beautification, uh, opportunities uh, for summer camp. We actually put on a sports camp over the summer. Uh, lots of things to do through that, through that nonprofit. But then we also have local partners that work with the homeless, uh, women's shelters, uh, human trafficking, on and on. It's as simple as asking, what are we doing? And we can find something for you to do. So the best way is to come by the Bridging Center on a Sunday or, or go online or, or give a call. call the church? Yeah, okay. call, ask for me, ask for Peggy. Uh, we will be happy to give you information and um, would love to see grow groups take mm -hmm. the initiative as groups. Yeah, it, it, it's a great places. way to, to strengthen your group and grow. It is. We often say the quote from Matt Carter that if you're aiming for mission, you always get community because every trip we've ever been on, you come home with this great community sure. of the people that you were there. And so it's a yeah. great opportunity for our grow groups to serve as well to build community and make a difference. So thanks today for the great reminders and some really practical steps that we can take as part of next. Good. And thank you for joining us here today. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.